Welcome back to the live stream. This week, we've got Professor David Fields. We're going to be talking about foreign exchange and all things economics. Be kind, stay safe, and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the live stream. It's July 22nd, 2023. We've got David Fields here today. He's a very special guest. I'm really excited to talk to him. Uh, all things um, foreign exchange, international economics, anything ma macroeconomic, really. Um, so that's going to be really, really exciting. Mike Radzicki is going to be away for four weeks. So if you don't see him, he's fine. He's doing his vacation stuff. Um, I hope he has fun. Hello to everybody in the chat. This way with my finger. So we've got Jens Renberg. We've got WWE Fan 0104 Process Server. Is this a real person or is this a process server? And Michael, of course, Michael's here. I'm glad to see you, Michael. So if you got questions, uh, make sure you put them in the chat. We'll try to get to them. We, we don't always get to them all. Um, hit the like button. That really helps in the algorithm. Put a comment after the video, after we're done the live stream. You can actually make comments underneath the video. Tell us what you think of the show. Am I doing a bad job? Was the guest good? Was the guest bad? Does Steve Keen's internet connection suck? Is it good? Who knows? What about Dan's philosophy? Speaking of Dan, Dan was not here last week. I'm going to bring him on first. Daniel Sanderson, here he is. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's it going, Ty? Oh, it's, it's going good. I, I missed you last week. It was tough running the show by myself. Oh goodness! I what was the story? Was uh, was was Steve in an airport or something? Or what was that? What was that all? Mm -hmm. about? Yeah, they okay. finally de they finally deported him from America. They had oh, enough good, of his yeah. ra radical economics. And they identified him with the guy with the big mask on. Is that how they? Yeah, they that was him? that was probably the initiating factor. Um, you know, that can be quite alarming when you're going through airport security to see a person with a mask and a tube going to their face, but. You know, you imagine everybody the makes FBI the choices. sketch of the hunted man that is Steve Keen. Like it would be just <laughs> horrific, right? He's like, oh <laughs> uh, yes, 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 yes. I'm going to get you to do the list because you right. you were away. Um, now I have to declare I kind of ran behind schedule and I didn't pull a put a full list together. So I've extent made it quite quite long. But you get a reprieve this week, is what I'm trying Wait, to say. Wait, before we do that, I, I have to bite at this. So Michael D'Souza Cruz asked me if I've read any works by Mark Johnson in the chat, right? Okay. Or the cognitive linguist George Lakoff. Yes, George Lakoff. No, not Mark Johnson. But uh, yeah. Um, and 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 George's work is is quite incredible. And so thank you for that. And maybe I'll, I'll look up Mark Johnson. Mm, Thanks, okay. Michael. Yes, yeah, so we'll just take that away. Take that away. Okay. Can we can we go to Steve? It's just he's just tempting us. He's he's just he's just tempting us. Can we? Oh, okay. Can we, Let's I see, I see, I see what he's doing here. Steve Keen, here he is. Oh. <laughs> All right, mate. You have no try. I am your father. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, great stuff. Great this stuff. The Darth, the Darth Vader reveal for you. The pity it's not a black mask. It's got to be absolutely perfect. I must try that oh. the next time I, I buy, go, go buy a mask or myself. I find an N95 that's got a hole in it like this one has with the black, and I can then do my little routine here. Uh, yeah. You know, as, as my, getting, I've seen, go ahead, Steve. I'm getting even more contrarian about wearing it. I mean, I've actually enjoyed the fact that people look at me and go, what the hell is this? You know, weird looks. No, so I've seen get a Mm. I've I've seen the comments where people kind of pick on you a little bit, but we have to declare you have been COVID free for three and a half years. So, mm -hmm. right. So it's maybe uh, just goes to say that Steve's got the the higher reasoning going on with wearing that. So 
that right on this particular issue. Yeah, definitely. Dan mm. Daniel Daniel, are you ready? I'm ready. Yes, and COVID free as well. I have to I have to tell everybody. Good. Oh, mm. okay. Good. Okay, top chatters, Bob Lior, W WE fan 0104, Lana Dell hates the clock, uh, Jens Runberg, Dry Eye, Web Freaks, Dreg Eye, couple eyes, Ghost on the Half Shell, James, James, TRCF, and Simborska. Top chatters. I, I, I can't resist making it. We've got Dreg Eye here twice, have we? Oh, boys. Okay, so okay. literally, no, no, I did. No, no, I did. I've, I've got. Yeah, I've, I've just actually been just watching by, by sheer accident. I've been seeing some ads on Twitter for Cheech and Chong's Chewies, which I almost bought some of when I was in the States, but there was nothing handy in Princeton as an outlet. And I, must, I mentioned that because I, I have actually seen Cheech and Chong live. For those who don't know Cheech and Chong, I'm sure you can yeah. find a Cheech and Chong image somewhere there, there, Ty. Anyway, one of the great jokes, they, they, were interview, they did an interview, uh, Cheech interviewed Chong, and Chong was, uh, was being Harry Harry Palms who had uh, won the American Masturbation Championships coming first and third. So we have Dragai coming, what, fourth and sixth. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay. So that was done at 7.30 this morning, my time. Um, so I, I, I apologize. What you were doing before that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if, if Mike was here, this would be his face. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Good one. Okay. <laughs> There's something to us old bastards. We can pull some pretty funny faces sometimes. Uh, I think I think it's time to get this on the rails and bring yeah. on David the man. Here he is. <laughs> In silence, so I can't hear a word here. <laughs> In the flesh. Do we have audio? Good. Okay. There we go. Yep, audio. Oh. Mm. Steve, did you not hear the applause? Yeah. No, I didn't. I, it was sometimes oh. there's, not just that I'm slow coming out, but sometimes the information is slow coming in here. I didn't actually hear the applause. So. Oh, is, is it slow in your headphones or slow in your head? <laughs> okay. I, I get concerned because there was a long pause after that. You know... <laughs> Uh, just, uh, just, the internet, as we, as we know, everybody knows our packet switching technology. There are reasons that some things go disappearing into the ether if the connection is a bit slack. So the laughter, the laughter has ended up being canned. Pardon the pun. Oh, okay. There, there was, there was applause going on, and okay, well, okay. Okay. Uh, David, how are you doing, buddy? I'm well. I'm well. I, I, uh, I can't thank you enough for having me on here. This is exciting. A wonderful opportunity. Get to converse things that I um, that I deeply love, which also makes me depressed. But it's better to be an unhappy Socrates oh. than a contented fool, um, especially in these times. So uh, I can't wait to get started and and uh, engage with you guys. This is going to be uh, incredible amounts of fun. So thank you. Well, I guess the first question is because we're we're going to discuss economics. Is how did you get into economics? What's the story behind that? It's a very good question. Um, there's actually a little bit of backstory. Uh, so I'm from Massachusetts. Um, went to University of Massachusetts, and uh, um, I was originally a political science uh, major. And then my folks said, you know, why don't you try economics? You know, to round you out because you know what you want to go into business and and and, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, little did they realize that UMass Amherst has a very unique econ program that was spoke my language, so to speak. So uh, I said, fine, you know, make the folks happy. I will go and and uh, take on my economics major at UMass Amherst. Um, and that ended up being the best thing because I helped Chris, <laughs> and everybody knows what UMass Amherst is like. Um, that further enhanced my thinking and uh, led me on a long trajectory and got me deeply wedded into heterodox, radical, uh, critical, economics and uh here i am today writing talking speaking about it and um trying to work for uh making the world a better place hey david i i, I actually have no idea what emirates is uh as, as an economics uh, you mass emirates yeah yeah well, what, so, what um, makes it what makes it and what characterizes this uh this this special school of yours sure sure so um there are specific schools within the U.S. that have a long tradition of uh, 
of heterodox economics, um, radical political economy, uh, non-mainstream, but you know, folks like to consider Austrian as non-mainstream, but I say um, Bullock's that's that's mainstream. So I'm talking about uh, mm -hmm. radical. Uh, critical economics, and there are particular schools that have that, that tradition. And UMass and UMass and Amherst is one of them, um, mm. where you get to learn Marx, uh, really learn Marx, uh, and, you know, and uh, classical political economists of Ricardo, and, and uh, heavy on class relations and mode of production analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And UMass Amherst has that tradition. And because of that, uh, I got deeply wedded and uh, it helped me foster my path towards uh, delving more into it. So um, UMass Amherst, um, if you look it up and you see the folks mm -hmm. that come out of that school, um, it's it's pretty radical, mm. which is great. Interesting. interesting. And yeah, actually, the two, two things I want to talk about as a result of that, David. One is, yeah. why do you think UMass has managed to hang on to its radical core when places like Cambridge have had it terminated by neoclassicals taking over? You know, that's, it's a very good question. And to be honest, I, I don't have the answer, but I would say there are folks there that have kept the tradition alive, like Bob Pullman, uh, Jerry Epstein, and a few others that have been able to keep UMass embers that stronghold, which can't be said for the same like other schools. I mean, look what happened in Notre Dame. Look what happened to um, UC Riverside. Um, not to... You know, not to say anything bad about other schools, so I don't want to. Um, there might be folks on here like, no, I'm there, and it's still radical. But um, mm -hmm. there are other schools that would say uh, we're still radical, and I, I would say I disagree. But I'm not going to go. Yeah, down that route actually, Michael Ma Michael D'Souza made an interesting comment there. Yeah. Uh, public versus private institution. So mm -hmm. is UMass is it UMass a private university? Well, that's a very intriguing question, right? I mean, what's the difference between public and private institutions nowadays, given well, the... Funny, uh... <laughs> funny thing, actually, there's an important question here in terms of um, yeah. non, non neoclassical economics, because... No, but UMass uh, like, Amherst is a public. Sorry? UMass Amherst is a public institution. It's public. Okay, well, that's, see, the intriguing thing is, and it, what, what what I've found to say in the Australian it's, it's the system, the UK mm -hmm. system, and uh, uh, quite a bit of the rest of the world, um, the private universities are, are freer of being dominated by neoclassicals than the public are because mm. they don't have to be part of the overall uh, approval system that's been instituted. And bureaucrats, not knowing any better, um, yeah. left, left the... Uh, you, the actually, so, Michael, this is reverse to your argument here uh, because you cannot get a mainstream, a non-mainstream program into most public universities in Australia or the or UK uh, and I mentioned to some extent America as well, um, because the neoclassicals dominate the selection process. And like Cambridge, Cambridge um, UK was the bastion, of course, yeah. of non-orthodox economics back in the 50s, well, 40s, 50s and 60s. And, um, the and you then school. had, yeah, and then you had the neoclassical takeover. And I've spoken at Cambridge University UK these days. And, you know, the people I have to go up against there don't know the history of neoclassical economics, let alone the history of economics in general. Yeah. Um, they're, they're arrogantly ignorant and co confidently you know, aware of things think they're the only approach to economics that's ever existed. Mm -hmm. So I've, um, I've like, we, we now have the uh, MMT program being run by Stephen Hale out of Torrens University in uh, South Australia. And one reason that Stephen's been able to manage that is that it's a private university. So it doesn't have the same um, controls, the same pressure uh, that the public ones have to conform to what is the public definition of a discipline. Now, in most cases, that's not a good thing. Okay, but in economics, it's a bloody good thing because mm. it means neoclassicals don't decide what 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 counts as economics. Yeah, it, it, it's it's interesting, and um, I don't, uh, I can't explain um, why public or private has been able to keep the heterodox tradition alive in, in the U.S. But what I can say is, um, you know, dark money, whether it's Coke or whatever, um, mm -hmm. have been able to uh, penetrate many schools, both public and private, and mm -hmm. effectively diminish um, any significance of the heterodox tradition. 
And yeah, I mean, like Oxford and Cambridge in the UK are classic instances of that. Yeah, and uh, you know, and and, and like in in Australia as well. Um, the the, the the actually Michael's made another point there about uh, Massachusetts being more politically progressive. Maybe that's got an impact because of the way in which education funding is spread in the United States, more state based uh, than it is like national in the UK and so on. And uh, all the quality controls, you know, excellence yeah. frameworks, which the English are incredibly uh, are fond of, end up denigrating anybody with a publication record in non neoclassical journals. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you look at uh, look at Paul Sweezy, right? Paul Sweezy published in the American Economic Review. Could yeah. um, could any of us publish in the American? No, Economic Review? no not at all. I, I had I had a few very very a couple of fascinating re rejections in the AER with wow. my my favorite. I, I got into a fight with the editor after he rejected a paper of mine on Minsky. And I've got to hear about your economic studies here, Michael, rather than mine. But I'll just this is an interesting little little point here. Uh, and he, I got involved. I, he, he rejected me like a desk reject, send back the paper, send back the funds. He said he would have liked to hear how do markets reach equilibrium was an important question he wanted to know in my model. Well, fuck that. Oh. Um, so I, I had a go at him and uh, he came back at one point and I just, you're going to love this statement. In part of his re rejoinder to my criticisms, he said, but what if people get more information about the future? How will that change things? Information about the future so let me see so this so you're telling me the um you know uh what, what's his name uh, doc emmett hopped out of a delorean next to you and told it's going to happen and fucking earth that, that's that's how ignorant this lot are so you know no it, it's information information asymmetries in the future and beyond yeah that's right yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes yeah, anyway. yeah, so i'm glad you so are you you you're at ums or you're at utah no, I, I'm in Utah. I'm not in. Uh, I'm not at. I'm not in academia right now. Um, I'm an independent economist. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm an independent researcher. Um, so a lot of my work, and uh, it's not at the institution. It's outside the institution. Um, but that doesn't uh, preclude my uh, my work and my capacity to still contribute. So, and it's been fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't have, I don't have to go to any faculty meetings, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I know by, I mean, you, you know, just because you know, it's not a good thing. I know that it's not, the, it's a great thing not to have to go to faculty meetings because faculty, going to faculty meetings is like bashing your head against a brick wall. It feels <laughs> great when you stop. So I'm <laughs> delighted to walk out of Kingston University in 2018, never to return. So, Ty, you better take over here. I'm a bit too loquacious today. Actually, I'm I'm kind of curious. Let's um let's talk about the blog uh, that you work yeah. on, and let's talk about your connection to um, Professor Rashawn. How did you guys meet, and then how did you guys um, come up with the blog? What's the blog called? Um, what's its purpose? All that stuff. Yeah, you bet. Well, you know, uh, Mr. Rashawn, he sent me some really nasty emails. I'm kidding, Mr. Rashawn. If you're on here, I love you. Um, no, no, we actually, uh, we established a connection uh, a while back, uh, actually through uh, my mentor, uh, my teacher, um, my, uh, my renowned supporter, uh, Matthias Fernando. I met Professor Rochon through him uh, at conferences, and I was able to establish a connection with uh, Louis Felipe. And we've been in conversation ever since he's invited me to be part of projects, which has just been fantastic, especially because it's allowed me to um, uh, publish work that um, that I'd like to publish. Um, so from that on, he then asked me, would you like to be part of this um, this blog that I'm creating, but among others, which is the Military Policy Institute blog or um, the MPI blog, uh, where we wanted to take very esoteric information on monetary matters and make it readily available and readable for the broader public. So not to be, so you don't have to be an academic, but you can understand money critically because a lot of what's, um, and this is because neoclassic orthodoxy invades the public space for communication, uh, a lot of understanding of how money works and, and monetary policy um, is wrong. And we wanna say that this actually has a huge uh, effect on uh, distributional outcomes, um, production, etc. So 
<clears throat> the primary objective of this blog is to um, take the heterodox thinking, or I would say the correct thinking on money and monetary matters and related macroeconomics and make it understandable for the broader public. Uh, whether it's talking about the international reserve currency, why the dollar is so strong and why the United States uh, decline may not be so what it is. In fact, it could be exaggerated. U.S. is still powerful. And why? Because you have a reserve currency. We wanted to explain that in very simple terms. So people, when they talk about U.S. power, they can they can focus on that or other related matters. Why, when we had inflation, People thought like, oh, well, uh, it must be demand uh, outweighing supply. It must be a very, very hot labor market because uh, we're at the full employment equilibrium. Uh, but you see how this, this, this type of stuff is so ingrained in the broader public and it's wrong. We want to say not so fast. Here's what the Fed is actually hmm. thinking. They want to blame rising wages for something that is supply induced or uh, supply constraints or um problems with respect to international geopolitical matters. It's a lot more complex than this whole demand supply narrative. So we want to explain what actually is happening with inflation and, and actually explain um, what the Fed is doing is inherently um, regressive, an attack on working class interests and making the working class pay for um, problems that well, are not of their own doing. So. Uh, what we've called monetary austerity um, caused the recession for workers to pay for rising prices. So we try to explain that in, broad, in more simpler terms. Um, so <clears throat> this blog has been a very unique, innovative space to make what is apparently very complex matters easier for understand for the broader public. So when they're when they're looking at monetary policy, when they're looking at um, financial looking at accounts in the New York mm -hmm. Times or whatever newspaper, they can have a more critical lens to understand it and, and help uh, inform debate. Yeah, it's a very, very good blog. I've ever since you guys started it, I've, I've read almost, well, I won't say every article, but mm. probably out of all the, you know, monetary policy kind of blogs out there or topics or articles, I've, I've turned to that the most. I think it's very, it has a, it's had a diverse uh, group of authors in it. So I, I recommend anybody check that out. Uh, Medium.com slash at Monetary Policy Institute. Um, what's the um, Twitter handle so people can find it on Twitter? At Monetary Blog. At Monetary Blog. Check it out. Cool stuff. Daniel, since uh, Professor Rashawn was on, have you been reading the Monetary Blog? I did. And uh, out of everybody in this room, um, I um, like when I first started reading philosophy, I could get through um, a sentence, a paragraph. And I think it takes discipline to, to uh, push through the barrier. And I haven't been able to get my second wind um, on that blog yet. Uh, and, and I don't quite know why. I was going to I was going to ask you Ty when you're reading these um on that blog do you do you um have you got any ideas or made any content or developed any models as a result of as a result of what you've read on that on that blog yeah. or yes yes yeah. actually every everything that I I do like from uh, you know blogs of my own to you know displaying you know toy models of the economy is derived entirely of other people's work you know, mainly I, st I, st I start from, you know, Steve and then I add other people's ideas. But I think that's yeah. what you're supposed to do to move something along is, you know, take the best of what you find out there and integrate it all and, you know, find emergent properties. Well, so, yeah, no, I have taken things from that blog. It reminds me of a famous Keynes quote, right? I mean, didn't Keynes say that um, whatever new is based on some past or former economist? Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. At that extent, uh, that's actually that was, that, was, that was a negative one though. What he wrote was no, I know uh, it's a negative one. That's right, it's a negative one. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's actually a bad. Actually, <laughs> what did he actually say? Um, uh, it was bad, mad men in authority who do yeah. uh, distilling voices from the air are normally recant, re recounting the, the scribblings of some 
a, a academic uh, hack, effectively, some 30 years hence. Yeah, I think he said dead economists. I'm not, not accusing you, Ben. I think he said dead, like uh, some like past dead or economist. Possibly. Yeah. I'll, so, I'll yeah, it, and see it what seems I can find, right. Yeah. Uh, it's actually not a good comment, but you can take it in a positive light that you know you are taking. Stuff I, I think what you actually meant to talk about was we stand on the shoulders of giants, which actually yeah. comes from Newton and can be dated right back to Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, I'll stop being a heavy just academic don't now. Just don't practice usury, <laughs> right? And also, yes, yes, <laughs> that too. Um, so, yeah, very, very interesting. I, I mean, if you think about it, it, it's it's actually almost impossible as a social animal to try and come up with a an entirely unique idea. Like, it, if you really think about how how ideas arrive as a social animal, it is in response to um, into other ideas that are already out there. Like, it's. It's but there's, but there's there's an interesting actually Dan just on that point I've just have been thinking about this just the last week in the context of evolution um, because there are uh, there's the standard explanation of evolution is you know the survival of the fittest a tiny modification in one direction makes you less susceptible uh, to whatever's wiping out your remaining cohort and so that gets reproduced over time it's, it's actually a very interesting tweet i saw tw twitter stream i saw on the evolution of the flatfish for example on that front um, but there are also evolutionary changes where there's a very sudden transformation from one structure to another and there's a great book i raved about a while ago called uh, quantum evolution by john joe mcfadden and then another one matching by a guy called jesse swartz called sudden origins how do you suddenly have for example, fish with teeth versus fish without teeth. How do you gradually acquire teeth? In fact, you don't. It's a single single mutation that goes from a jawline to a set of teeth. So there can be. Now, what I'm what I'm sort of in by analogy here is saying that there there are developments which are a slow accretion to previous ideas, and that's the sort of gradual change we can get. But somebody can come up with an idea which is definitely based on somebody else's previous idea, which revolutionises everything. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so hopefully we're getting towards that stage for not heterodox economics because, you know, we know the neoclassical is never going to produce anything of merit, so it's our turn. And it's always rated right at, the, at the crossing of the Rubicon, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, effectively, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's, your, what's, um, what, what's your contribution to crossing the Rubicon, David? <laughs> My presence. Um, <laughs> come on. Let's, let's be honest. Silly folks. Silly folks. <laughs> um, I, I mentioned this when I was talking about the blog is that um, you know, economics affects every facet of social life. And um, if the ultimate ideation of freedom is to expand human potential, we need to understand it and make it readily accessible so they can think critically about it. So when I look at issues of interests, right, I try not to continue. I mean, models are important. Um, if you have to use the esoteric language, you have to because that's just part of, you know, what it is. But if you can make it readily accessible and readable, readable to the masses, so to speak, right. they can have the tools, the capacity, the capability, uh, the strength, the challenge convention and spearhead the process of revolutionizing um, matters at hand to expand human potential and, and, and come up with something creative that expands um, what we call freedom. Um, so I guess my crossing of the Rubicon or my presence is to do just that. Uh, I've done it in my writings. I've done it in my when I've given lectures is to, to help make what is seemingly very complex concepts readily understandable so when they look at something like can i say bullshit i can say bullshit right mm -hmm. okay well bullshit when you look at the bullshit notion of quantum theory of money that oh we can't do fiscal spending because it'll cause inflation well we know fiscal policy if done right aggregate demand management helps working class folks and if someone says well, we can't do that because too much money uh and, and say and, and help explain to the layman why this is bullshit mm, why mm. it's based on bullshit why it continues to produce bullshit they can call it for what it is bullshit 
and help um, get rid of such nonsensical terms like that. And when they look at fiscal policy, you know, given the, uh, the certain condi conditions, like, yes, this is going to help me. Why are we continuing with this useless, pathetic concept? Well, the reason it pervades is because there are certain power interests that don't want fiscal, such fiscal policy to happen because if we reach full employment and other things, you know, it, it benefits working class people. And as Koleski noted, that could be a problem for powers that be. Um, so back to what I said before, my, uh, my uh, presence or my here place on earth is, is, um, to be a messenger of of uh, making things that are seemingly esoteric actually understandable because it can't it, it, it is understandable if given the right methods. Uh, how do you make right. um how do you make it guys? You're partially referring to like for monetary policy. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing that you're you're referring to uh, MMT. Is that is that is that right? Well, <clears throat> so MMT. Um, so we all know modern monetary theory and, you know, the job guarantee and the idea of monetary sovereignty and, and um, the role of fiscal policy. Um, the basic underpinning of that school is a long tradition, uh, uh, in my view, of functional finance, um, you know, from F.J. Domar. Um, and his name is escaping me. I don't know why it's escaping me. F.J. Domar, Abba Lerner. Um, mm. It's a long tradition. So in my view, when I look at MMT, I, I look at that as continuing that tradition, saying that there is room. In fact, there's a huge capacity for building on the forces of how we can um, spearhead fiscal policy to reach full employment and have growth that has mutually beneficial outcomes and broadly shared wealth. That's when I look at MMT. Now, sure, there are a lot of issues of a disagreement like well should the periphery have or, or a third world i hate to use that term but people know what i'm talking about when i use that um should they have exchange rates or is the issue capital controls in my view the issue is capital controls but <clears throat> but uh, on a broader level i think what the mmt folks are doing is actually something quite great which is spearheading and making mainstream or at least trying to that notion of functional finance so doing what i've tried to do is make something complex easier to understand so we can uh -huh. help um uh effect progressive policy that helps um those who uh who have to um sell their labor power for sustenance tell me tell me why do you think the issue is really centered around capital controls um, and what are your insights there? Sure. Um, so I come from, I come from, I guess my training or my learning or my interests, uh, Latin American structuralism. So when looking at the periphery, the third world, etc., yes, they have their resource rich and, you know, they, there are different ways, different institutions to try to, um, establish a capacity, a capacity for autonomous growth, but there are, not a supply constraint, but there are demand constraints. And those demand constraints, given the nature of the international financial framework that we're embedded in, um, at any given moment, uh, because they don't have, or for reasons of historic, the reasons of history, cannot issue government debt in their own currency and have to rely on foreign capital. And if there's no if there's no uh, way to harness that because it can leave at any moment in time, uh, it leaves such countries and, and, and such areas in a huge, huge predicament. Um, because with the loss of capital, no matter what exchange rate you have to pursue long run growth, despite what resources institutions they have, is uh, is, a, is a huge, huge problem. Um, United States, and this is where MMT is right, we don't have that problem because we're the international reserve currency. We can spend as much as we want. Um, sure, if capital, um, lack of capital controls can be a problem, but the government can has the capacity to um, uh, counteract that. We don't is a political choice. Um, like in the, in the periphery where it's, it's more, uh, more or less uh, an international economic one. Um, but Going back to what I said, these are nuanced differences 
which I think, in my view, can be resolved with uh, the, the leading folks of MMT. And in fact, you have one, um, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of his first name. So I'm going to say his last name, Scylla. And you have other folks like um, Fidel Kaboob, where you can um, use the insights of MMT to try to relate what's happening in the periphery. And I would just add, OK, let's let's also focus on uh, building and enhancing the international financial architecture. So when the issue of lack of capital controls does come out, we, we can we can we can um, have the appropriate solution. In fact, a sociologist, uh, Peter Evans, when he uh, wrote the book Embedded Autonomy or um, in his other book, Dependent Development, there are ways. It's just we have to do our homework. Steve, what can you add on to that? <laughs> Actually, I just got distracted by some of the conversation going to the side about a break here, so I, I can't really could Steve really was completely ignoring me. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly, suddenly mentioned this coin called a brachia in the in the conversation that I hadn't seen of before. What's that? And I got halfway through the searching, so I'm sorry I missed the last thirty seconds. You're fine. It's okay. Oh, ghost, ghost on the half shell. Right? <laughs> that this one, this one right here. Uh, interesting. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Wow, an expiry date. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there is a comment in the center that says, uh, I think it's from Andrew Baker that said, but capital flight can happen in, in, from, from Greece to France. Yes, that's true. And that actually captures a unique situation to Europe uh, based on historical uh, evolutionary forces. Uh, Greece has become what can, one can be considered the periphery of the, uh, of the European uh, theater, so to speak. And so Greece suffers... From the same constraints of um uh first of all not having to be able to issue debt in its own currency which was the leading cause of the crisis and was it like early 2010s or, or or i think it was when we had the euro crisis um yeah greece uh very much suffers some same issues as you would see in uh in our in argentina or uh even worse uh, a country in africa uh, what what we see in, in countries in the African continent. Um, so yeah, to answer Andrew Baker's comment, Greece suffers for a lot of the problems as we see in the periphery because it's the periphery of the European economy. You are, you are now quickly becoming the favorite guest we've had because you are acknowledging questions from the ah! chat. So that's <laughs> perfect. And I want to just take this time to acknowledge all the chatters. Thank you for being here on a Saturday morning for some, Saturday afternoon for others, Saturday evening um, for people in Europe. And if you're really ballsy and you're you're over in some Asian countries or Australia, you should go to sleep and just watch <laughs> actually, the recording. Actually, I can, say, I can tell you that applies to Andrew Baker, who's a good friend of mine from Sydney. Oh, oh. Good, good, good. Andrew Baker, you're going to make it on the list next week as a top chatter. <laughs> and with that, make sure you're hitting that like button. If you've forgotten, it helps us on the algorithm. If you haven't subscribed to the Prof. Steve Keen uh, YouTube channel, do that and hit the notification button so you know uh, that the show is about to start. If you're on Twitter and you're watching the live stream there, hit the like button, retweet, then come over here and chat. I can't connect a bot to Twitter, so I can't see your your chats in live. I actually have to go on my Twitter app to see them. Uh, so if you're there and you've got a YouTube account, um, yeah, there's a world clock. Um, what what do we got? Two in the two, morning. Two thirty in the morning. That is crazy. Yep, Andrew. That's Andrew. He, okay. Yeah, he must be on a lot of coffee right now. <laughs> Andrew, if you could just go ahead and like my Twitter feed too, and tell the others to like mine, you know, because I want the I want the bot to track. You know, I'm kidding. no, no. Here we go. So we've got where we've got David David Fields. Make sure you're following him on oh. Twitter. You know, he's the man. We like him now. He is now part of the Stephen Friends family, for sure. What kind of work are you doing right now? Like, what's your, what's your main main focus? You know, right now. Actually, you know, um, so it's a little bit different what I've done. Uh, well, I, mean, I still continue to write about monetary macroeconomics and international finance and related topics for the blog. And, and when I get a chance for an academic paper, but I've, um, I've, 
moved into an area uh, based on a, actually a very good colleague of mine, Iris Cooter. She's at Idaho State, who's brought me along and uh, engaging in work on uh, this burgeoning subfield of, of stratification economics, which I've been actually quite, uh, I find quite interesting. And, and looking at uh, social location beyond class, like the role of status, the role of occupational prestige, gender, and other social locational variables and how they affect economic outcomes. Um, in fact, we just had a, we had a paper published in the Review of Political Economy edited by, you know, Mr. Rashon um, and others. Uh, no offense to the others that are part of the editorial team. Um, <clears throat> where we uh, empirically manifested the extent to which uh, occupational prestige, taking into account uh, race and gender and even class, has an effect on uh, on status outcomes. Uh, you know, so we infused a lot of Faber, a lot of Veblen, and in fact, it was quite significant. So, when we look at occupational prestige, like how um, culture determines what's important and not important or how historically specific social factors uh, deem what's worthy and not worthy, that has a huge, a huge effect on uh, employment outcomes and, and distributional outcomes. And we're able to have that paper published. And it, it's, it's, a, it's work that I have not you know, historically done, but I'm doing it now and, and I find it incredibly interesting. And actually it helps, it's part of, it's part of my um, scope, if you will, of uh, looking at factors and make it easy to understand of why we have a huge amount of social inequity and what is preventing the capacity for progressive policy. So I find it as a huge contribution. And other work is involved with the political economy of housing. And um, I've delved into see the extent to which uh, the financialization of housing, which involves a lot of monetary macroeconomics, um, prevents the capacity of having um, affordable housing. Like, why isn't housing affordable? Well, the extent to which financialization reigns supreme and uh, welfare state retrenchment uh, makes housing a basic foundation of economic ins insecurity uh, unattainable, and then it's just a downward spiral. Um, so that's other work I've been doing. Um, and also the other work is, uh, trying to be a great dad and I, hopefully I'm doing, uh, doing well on that, <laughs> but that's primary. <laughs> Dan, Dan, what are you thinking? Did you say, were you referring to Weber, like Max Weber, the, the correct. Um, yep. Okay. And yep. so, yeah, as a, as a psychologist, right. So he's, um, uh, like, I guess out of the the main psychologists in in history, yeah, he's more empirical orientated, and it's interesting. So you've taken got, he's actually yeah more he's a sociologist yeah. more than a psychologist, Dan. Oh, okay, okay. Though he yeah. uh yeah. his grad though his his grad was economics, though if I re if I recall, wasn't it? Like, wasn't his uh right. wasn't his degree or wasn't his professional degree? Actually, his professional degree was in law, if I re if I recall. More likely. I mean, you, you're talking back at a time, like, yeah. you know, Marx has, has a PhD yeah. in philosophy yeah. because there were no PhDs in economics yeah. at the time. Exactly. Like, and he, was, and he was studying philosophy anyway. But, yeah, if you go back to the 19th century, likely to find degrees are going to be called philosophy degrees. Yeah. And then what anybody does can go in all sorts of, you know, what we now see as different topical directions like, like economics and sociology and so no, on. No, the, the, the method and straight fucked everything up. Who was that? Right? Yeah, the method yeah, and straight yeah. fucked everything up. Give, give uh, Dan some details there, David. That's got, he's obviously got his curiosity. Oh, sure, sure. So, <laughs> so Max Weber, um, uh, and Steve's right, yeah, he was more of a sociologist, but I would say, I mean, he's a social scientist, which includes psychology, economics. In fact, you look at Max Weber and a lot of his work. Um, so he had one book on the spirit of capitalism, which I don't agree entirely because he thinks that um, um the Calvinism was the spearheading factor for the rise of capital capitalism, which I get, but I, I disagree with, but that's just, that's a whole different area. But Max Weber wrote a lot on uh, what's called status. Um, so um, whether you are um, considered uh, a well-to-do person, not based on your economic position, but 
whether it's your occupation or whether you're in a position in an, an exclusive club or you dress the way you do, et cetera, you try to see status, that type of, you know, prestige or level has an effect on outcomes. And he wrote a lot on that. And um, so that's why I was able to extract, or not just me, my, my colleagues like Iris and others were able to extract the, the, the work on status inspired by Max Weber and how that in conjunction with economic class, you know, based on your, your how much income and where you, whether or not you have to sell your labor power, et cetera, uh, has an effect on um, distribution of outcomes. Um, but going back to Max Weber, uh, he, he, Max Weber tends to not be, from what I find, is not focused a lot in, in, in the field of economics, a lot in sociology, because a lot of work is considered sociological. But economics, in my view, is political economy, so we should incorporate it, despite some of his writings that many of us folks would disagree with. It's still very, very important. Um, like he wrote a, a, a huge volume called The General Economic History, which I think is brilliant. And I think more um, it would help more economists if we look at such readings. In fact, Max Weber wrote a lot on money. And in fact, if you look, uh, and Jeffrey Ingham, if I recall, who's a sociologist by profession, I think he's retired, um, when he wrote the book called The Nature of Money, which talks about how money is a social relation, heavily, heavily centers on the work of Max Weber. Um, so to answer, um, he was a, yes, he was a psychologist, you know, based on uh, how one views rationality. Uh, but he was more of a his work uh, for my purposes and for, I guess, for political economy purposes. Um, he had to do with sociology, economics, and how status and social relations and positions in society uh, affect the nature of work and distribution. So I hope that answers. Well, it's, yeah, no, it's interesting. I, um, uh, I, I, I've just, uh, as a heuristic, I've kind of bookmarked yeah. him as, as, uh, as an, uh, as an empirical, uh, take, trying to take an empirical approach as opposed to somebody like, uh, Sigmund Freud or, yeah, sure. You know, it's, um, you know, there's a little bit more due diligence and care with the, how he approached problems. I would, yeah. I would say. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Steve, what is that's where the method and stride. That, that's where the method yep. and stride comes in. Yep. Uh, where the where the uh, uh, deductive method uh, versus the historical method was the main focus, and you could certainly locate Weber in the historical method. Uh, whereas when neoclassicals won, when they, you know, they they won by ignoring the opposition, which is the yep. usual way they win, um, and they argued that it has to be all based on deductive logic and the. So, and then they, they saw having a set of axioms to work from as the essence of a science, completely misunderstanding how the science actually developed and, in, of course, how, how social science should have developed. So if, if Weber had won that particular debate, we would be calling him an economist yep. today. Yep. Well, I have to give a plug for critical theory in that regard, which usually I'm against, but it, I think that that's one advantage of a, of, of a critical theory approach is uh, is the historical waiting or consideration, I think would be, would be fair to say. Would you agree, David? Yeah, I would. Absolutely. In fact, um, Max Weber um, is heavily relied on in, in the critical theory school, especially when talking about the difference between instrumental, um, I forget the other word he used, but the ideation of rationality and technological rationality and how we get all caught up into this <clears throat> idea of means ends cost benefit nonsense and we ignore the social institutions social atmosphere social sphere around us that prevents us from thinking about the inherent contradictions of the society of which we're embedded in and that's the whole embodiment of critical theory was to weed out and make relevant those contradictions again and show how this rationality that we've been so that we've been so ingrained to and some soon by prevents us from seeing those contradictions and resolving them. Um, you know, that was the whole embodiment or the essence of the new left in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Um, David, you know, I, I ask this question to almost all the guests and some of them just think it's a preposterous question to even bother asking and some like the question and some are, you know, indifferent. Since we're, we're headed to the end of the first 
first hour and we'll keep you into the second hour, of course. Um, but I want you to lay out what needs to change in the economic profession and uh, academic economics. What are the, the major changes that need to happen to make it uh, uh, the world a better place for human beings in general? Well, you asked a very intriguing question. Um, do I uh, sponsor revolution? Well, you know, something has to be done. Something has to be changed. Um, but going back to the economics profession and the academic economics, um, people have to recognize that this quantity over quality, I think, that pervades academic publishing and that pervades many departments is very detrimental. Uh, it's actually what's undermining the critical tradition of heterodoxy, where it's like publish, 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 quantitative models, 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 want to throw in variables, do fancy statistics, all that. In my view, sure, statistics is important, economics is important, but this whole idea of trying to be as scientific as you can, I think is a facade. I think it's just a, a mystification and it's affected many, many departments and even in the uh, in academia and in the profession. And that has, um, in my view, uh, fostered a lot of obfuscation and helped contribute to neoclassical mainstream orthodoxy and has undermined um, what was once a very strong radical political economy tradition. Because when, when that, you know, heavy focus on econometrics and, and models and et cetera was not reigning supreme, even though mainstream was still at the home, radical political economy could at least be talked about. Hence, Paul Sweezy publishing an American Economic Review. Um, or even mainstream folks quoting Monthly Review. I mean, that used to happen. We would never see that now. Mm. Um, so <clears throat> that has to change. Um, saying that, yeah, econometrics is just a tool. It's not the be-all, end-all. Um, it's not the <laughs> it's not the ultimate uh, luminous summit, so to speak. The tool. Uh -huh. So that needs to change. Two, um, divisiveness among critical folks like us and others. We have to work, even though we have our differences and we have our different ways of analyzing how things happen, we have to come to agreement in some way, shape, or form. Otherwise, our divisiveness and intellectual animosity, which actually gets really ugly from what I've seen, is going to <clears throat> make the mainstream say, they're fighting amongst, they're, they're destroying themselves. Um, so yeah. we, can, we can still be here and still control everything. So we have to work out our differences. We have to. Otherwise, we're going to still be uh, not winning. Um, so that has to change. And third, um, we have to continue. What I mentioned is my primary motive of uh, if we want, if we if we deem working class folks or those, like I said, who have to sell the labor power or are the agents of transformation, we have to make sure the tools are readily available and we cannot continue to speak in esoteric. Because if we do, the revolution that I want to see or the change that I want to see, and I'm sure you folks want to see, will continue to be difficult. Steve, at, I know you were listening that time. So I uh, kind of add on. <laughs> Finally. <you know>, yeah. <laughs> kind of add on. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, like, I, well, my addition there will be that w it's an unintentional side effect of trying to make education better and streamlining it. The bureaucrats have set up, you know, quality control institutions, the refereeing process itself in many ways. Uh, in the belief that we'll get quality coming out the other side. And those bureaucrats, unfortunately, are ignorant of the issue of paradigm change uh, because the, the huge advances in science have come when we've overthrown the existing paradigm. Now, if you imagine that Galileo could only have got published if Ptolemaic astronomers approved his papers for publication, <laughs> we would never have learned of the, of the, of the sun-centric view of the universe. And uh, you, you have to be a maverick and push outside to make paradigmatic change. Now, unfortunately, all the funding systems reward research positions. They all come in. Are you published in the top journals? Yeah. Translation. Are you published by Ptolemaic astronomers? Okay. Um, you know, and, and that's the problem. We, we, we really, we, 
we we need desperately need um, a, a system of research and research funding that rewards mavericks as well as rewarding the mainstream because sometimes the mavericks going to be where in the general paradigm changes are going to come from for example in physics you have a, a huge dominance now of string theory and to, to their credit physicists are starting to say what's going on here no testable hypotheses in 40 years mm -hmm. um but what 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 happens in economics neoclassical economics we won't listen to those heterodox lot they're cranks i'm sorry the real world is the other way around um so as so long as research funding amplifies the existing paradigm largely because it's been designed without awareness that paradigms exist then we won't break the neoclassical hegemony and, and uh, actually going back to uh, max weber uh, a huge problem is this excessive professionalization impact factors i mean come on mm. um and then rely and then having funding tied to that because of how much professionalization how much you quoted etc cetera, etc cetera. is that science i don't think so. mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I have to say that it's uh, it is a discipline, right? I mean, let's take inventory about what it is right now. And I was, uh, you know, just this morning, I was thinking, what am I, what am I going to talk about, or where's my mindset when it comes to summarizing economics? And uh, um, it's a discipline right now, right? So mm -hmm. it's a practice, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, we can we can say and we can summarize to say that it's in a it's in a descriptive phase right now. It's describing mm -hmm. what reality is. And I think the danger in lies, uh, fundamentally, you're going to look at this, you're going to say the danger lies in, try, in, in moving that into prescription versus prediction. So the question that I really want to kind of start the next series or the next, as we go to break, we come back in is, how do we make uh, the discipline more predictive? That's really- Well, important. it's actually, I wish it was actually, I wish it wasn't a descriptive size, Dan. Um, economics is in is a, is in a fantasy stage. Mm. Yeah? What deductions follow from our axioms? Uh, oh dear, those deductions don't follow. Let's just ignore that problem and continue on. They're miles from being descriptive. In fact, if anybody's being descriptive, it's the post Keynesians and the MMT crowd who are trying to say, for Christ's sake, stop talking about a fantasy world. Let's describe the real one. Mm. Look, Steve, I I agree with you on that, but I think I think oh. the I think. I think what normally what comes up is to try and stay now a step forward and say, all right, well, we can criticize that. OK, beyond criticism, uh -huh. what is the compelling evidence that would change people's minds? Pre predictive means efficiency. Predictive means undisputable. Predictive uh -huh. means, you know, let's roll up our sleeves and try and turn this discipline into a science. You know, I mean, maybe it's uh, platonic, but that's ideal. That is ideal. For it, is, it, is, it is ideal, but they don't listen to those predictions. I mean, you know, I, you know I'm one of the handful of predicted the, the economists. Plenty of other people saw the financial crisis coming, but I predict the damn thing. And what, what, what's these days? Dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models still dominate the profession. Yeah. So, um, you know, you can, you, can, you can make a right prediction. They can still ignore you. And that's the problem. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, um, I think we're going to go into the second half of the show. Um, but if people are leaving now, um, uh, thank you, David, for being in the first hour. Uh, hopefully you can stay for most of the second hour, depending on your schedule. We'll see how things fly off the rail, rails. We'll see how things go. Everybody, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification button. If you're on Twitter, make sure you like, retweet, then come over here, join the chat. Stay tuned. We will be right back after this little cute cut scene I made six months ago. <laughs> Um, we did it again. Now, as I said, our last show was cancelled after you appeared on it, so fingers crossed the executives don't do that again. The more I read in the neoclassical thing, the more I, I just, you know, my scratching my eyeballs out all the time. I'm okay. the voice of God in the background. Oh, geez. <laughs> Once the coins get uh, warm enough because of your body temperature in the winter, it actually keeps you <laughs> moderate beer drinking in the evenings. Well, that's inspiring yeah. for a Saturday morning.
Still friends. After the show, we're back. I'll bring on Daniel. Daniel's in the background ready. Steve's in the background ready. And David will be back. He's uh, had to go perform a duty. But he'll be back <laughs> moment momentarily. Um, great conversation in the first hour. I like David. I like it. You know, I learned so much from this show. Uh, all the guests that have come on, I have taken a piece of their work um, and kind of added it to my own or at least to my own thought process. It gets me in trouble a lot because I now have this wealth of knowledge that is not centered on one specific group. So it, it makes it a little tough to navigate sometimes and pleasing everybody around me. But I prefer to have the knowledge and my own insights and see the world as I see it, I think, in the, the best logical way I can see it. What do you think, Steve? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, this is one of the difficult things about the many, many groups in heterodox economics and some of the conflicts between them. Um, so you have, for example, we, we had our, our guest, was it last week, on job guarantee versus universal basic income. And I see the level of animosity over those issues a bit over, overblown. Um, I also want to get onto the trade issue, because you know, as we know with MMT has this uh, you know, pro um, imports are a cost, exports are a benefit. Sorry, the other way around. Uh, uh, argument that I have no time for, but I don't, I'm not going to take it on because I want to see MMT succeed. So I'm not about to try to shoot their ankles off when they're being successful on other fronts. Um, and there are, there are a multitude of different approaches to economics. So MMT, even though it's a very important part of the uh, process, is not the way you try to analyze the production system, okay? which has got other issues of its own again. So all these things require a bit of um, uh, agnosticism about where you where you pick from. Uh, you, have, you know, And I think we are going to do better by blending all those approaches rather than by uh, you know, fighting off into separate camps and fighting each other in the way that Dave was talking about earlier. And now, David, I have to put you on the spot. Um, are, are are your reading skills um, okay? My reading skills? Yes, your reading skills. I sure hope so. Okay, because you're going to read the top <laughs> chatter list now. <laughs> well, hold on. As an I, academic, it's like <laughs> I, I have, I have, I'll, I've met some academics, or you know, in passing or indirectly, professors as well uh, that don't excel in all the areas of intellectual capacity. So I'm just asking. But anyways, so you, you. Well, I have my faults. I have my faults. There are a lot. <laughs> well, a hopefully. Lot. You could, Hopefully you can read the list. Top chatters from last week. David, go ahead. Okay. Uh, is that Bob Liori? Is that? See, look, I don't know if it's an indictment of my reading skills. <laughs> wait, 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 um, wait. Take it off. Take it off. Let me pull, pull it back. Pull it back. Okay. Pull hold back. on. Okay. Yeah. Hold, Dave, hold Dave, on. David, David, David. Okay. A little bit of coaching on this. You have okay. to just commit. There's no asking. You just have to, you have to accept the the blunder, right? You have to just <laughs> jump into it and say it with confidence, even if it's, Trust your intuition. Okay, pull it up again. Yeah, I love that. I guess yeah I'm gonna, and I'm gonna write that down because that's it. I'm gonna... No, it's I kind of maybe might uh, kind of compare it to you know when Bush launched a war to on the Middle East, and yeah. he the one thing I respected that guy for is he stuck with his guns and his narrative all the way through. And you almost at some point points you were like maybe it's good that the U.S. has invaded the Mil M Middle East and is killing innocent children and women. So I, I kind of want you, without that terrible rhetoric I just added, to kind of take that approach and go with it on each But isn't that, isn't that the definition of psychosis? Uh, well, there's there's a lot of uh, definitions on this. Here again, David. David, stop <laughs> thinking. Just stop. <laughs> okay, okay. Here we go. I'll stop thinking about it. Okay, here we go. All right, Bob Liore, WWE Fan 104, Lana Dell Hates the Clock, Jens Rundberg, Dregai, Web Freaks, Dregai again, Ghost on the Hash Cell, James Thames, TR, CF, and Simborska. Oh, 
<laughs> you get points for pronouncing the last one, at least convincingly, if not correctly. Yeah, no, I think you got the last one dead on. No, hey, right. Yeah. Ty, yeah. could we give could we give Lana a little special prop out? Because, like, let's say, like, I'm just throwing an idea here to the kind of like overriding decision maker here, which is Ty on the production. What if we had Lana's pitcher with Steve again, and every time she made it in the top three, she got the pitcher put up? I, I I can I can do that. Like the picture, like in the list, or the picture. No, no, just no, no. Like, well, up. the picture of her and Steve. Though, so if she makes it in top three, she gets the she gets she gets her picture, uh, you know, put up. Now, now I, I try not to make it a top like ranking list. It is just me blotting on the ch chatters that I saw last week. Uh, nobody oh, is a, a, above. So if if I put up a picture with Steve and uh, Lana. Then I have to put up a picture with Steve and Botch Mandela, and that's good. the logistics and the flights and the cost of that would be <laughs> extremely enormous. So well, I don't want to play we, favorites. No, no, but what if we actually prime the audience to say, "Hey, you know, like, you know, Photoshop Steve with you next to you, and then send us your images." Like, let's uh, and then. The, the the creepy factor there is, is <laughs> off off the charts, like completely off the charts. <laughs> okay, all right. Let's talk trade. Let's talk trade theory for a while, David. Say again. Sorry, did you? Let's uh, trade talk theory. talk trade theory. Let's talk about international trade. trade. Yeah, okay. give it to us. By the way, so, that was. That was an outburst in a classroom, and the teacher just said, okay, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Actually, it, rem it reminds me of, so um, I grew up in a very traditional, not traditional, that's the wrong word, um, stereotypical Ashkenazi Jewish household. So all the stereotypes are true, where it's like, David, you're on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> huh? My, I got schmutz on me. I'm sorry. Um <laughs> Oh, we should have brought this version out earlier. This is fun. I know I should have, right? <laughs> right. Sorry, uh, my folks are um, at a Seinfeld reunion. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> international trade. I mean, um, first, I mean, let's talk about um, what's happening with respect to uh, food, right, and and wheat production, and how the geopolitical conflict. Uh, we can not, we can talk about um, <clears throat> what spearheaded this geopolitical conflict. Um, uh, my views on that are aligned with um, what John Mearsheimer has had to say. But that's another discussion. Um, uh, like we've seen in, in the past with other geopolitical conflicts, when areas where there are primary products for uh, for long run sustainability, that has had huge implications. And in this case. Uh, wheat production is uh, just exacerbating wow. um, world hunger on top of a regime that has financialized food, um, where we saw grain as uh, a financialized economy to be traded. Um, so that on top of what this new geopolitical quagmire, in my view, is going to have severe trade consequences and exacerbate uh, hunger, which we're already starting to see, which is pretty terrible. Uh -huh. Did you notice the uh, news announcement that India has banned yep. exporting of any any not rice except basmati? I'm not quite certain why they exempt basmati. Yep. And maybe because it's a big revenue earner in exports, but they've banned rice exports. Yep. And that's a sign of just how fragile the food system is right now. Yep. And I presume what you're leading to is the argument that we should be tr trade is not actually a good thing yep. uh, when it makes you means you don't produce an essential input, which may cease being available. And certainly, lots of them are going to do that in in, in future climate circumstances. Yep. Yeah. And um, yes. go ahead, Dan. Were you about I, to say something? I just want to make sure I'm following this. So you're you're saying that um, in, in an instance, because of the financialization of um, of uh, food products such as wheat and rice, yep. that that countries will stop producing if uh, for the overarching need of uh, satiating hunger and feeding the masses because of, of just purely financial uh, export reasons. Is that correct? 
Well, not I would say not purely financial. I would say other geopolitical factors play a significant role. International dynamics and embargoes, and, um, you name it, they're a huge factor in um, in those exports and whether or not they get imported, etc. So it's not just the role of financialization. There are other significant variables involved in that. But the fact that we have uh, a neoliberal world economy where um, capital um, capital mobility uh, dumping um, you name it reigns supreme uh, primary commodities the basic foodstuffs are going to be incredibly volatile and countries that actually in nature are quite resource rich like many countries in the African continent and and and, and in Asia and uh, or the, the global south if you will um they should be the richest countries and be actually quite sustainable with their food production are not are not able to because of global dynamics and global configurations and a neoliberal red um world system if so to speak uh which goes back to my point earlier that um it's not exchange rates it's the nature of the institutional arrangement the nature of its relationship with the uh, center of why countries in the periphery, despite having resources and what look like uh, a pretty stable uh, political establishment, can't survive, and and uh, and their choices are limited on whether or not to export for the rest of the world or feed a society, to feed its own domestic economy, if you will. So what you're sketching for me and for the audience is that the the single most predictor of um, uh, of, uh, I guess, economic flourishing is um, yeah. a rebalancing of, of, of power. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I would argue that um, it requires world systemic. I mean, sure, you can try it uh, on the local level. And that's why I think the work of Peter Evans uh, is actually in, invaluable. Another work who have focused on internal conditions and how they can um, be enhanced and worked around given the external constraints, but those external constraint, not supply, demand, um, are pretty significant. And if we are going to solve problems, huge problems like hunger, the basic means to survive, um, world systemic transformations have to happen. And that requires rebalancing, uh, international cooperation, but you know we're we're embedded in a capitalist world economy and um and that's uh that's difficult right um when the profit motive reigns supreme and you have a difference between what constitutes the center and what constitutes the periphery uh, those who make international policy and those who have to deal with it um you can talk about all like you know homegrown grassroots efforts and i support that 100 percent but the reality is the way it is. I mean, call me a critical realist, call me a world system realist. I don't know. Call me whatever you want. Um, but that's a huge, huge barrier. So we got a question here from WWE fan 0104, Josh from Canada. Would you guys say there's a need um, to be an international institution that governs food production, maybe as a way to end world hun hunger? What do you think, David? Uh, I was absolutely any any way to uh, combat institutions like the World Bank and IMF and uh, all those all said forces where you know enhance UNICEF and we do have some we have UNICEF um, but you know <laughs> who's more powerful and who isn't uh, in fact uh, I think it's the United States that contributes the less the least out of the OECD countries in terms of donating for uh, uh, to help resolve world hunger. Uh, and that says a lot, right? I mean, that's uh, American um, uh, prowess, uh, right? <laughs> um, that says a lot about how we are as a society. Well, those who govern our society. Um, but to answer that question, yes. And I want it to be extremely powerful. If that enhances a lot of the uh, institutions with the UN, if that enhances UNICEF, that can combat the structural adjustment of World Bank and IMF and all those related institutions. Sign me up. Dan, what do you think? 
Hmm. I, well, look, I don't know if you guys have the patience for this, but I was going to push back on that. And uh, I heard Steve kind of chomping at the bit. So um, before I kind of, you know, throw my, my pushback out there to the ether, uh, Steve, I want to, I want to hear what you're about to say. Well, basically that it isn't so much international institutions. I think that'd be a, you know, international coordination is almost as much of an oxymoron as military intelligence. Yeah. Um, but if you, the focus of neoclassical theory has always been on comparative advantage, specialization, that's the route to growth. And when you take a look at the empirical data, you find, no, that's not the case. The countries that have grown most successfully have had diversified industrial structures, not specialised. Um, they have promoted domestic industries. They've gone against the whole idea of uh, let the market determine. They've been in favour of capital controls, as yep. one of David's earlier points. So if you look at the empirical data, it's not true that growth comes from specialisation. What actually can come from it is fragility. And that's one of the reasons I don't live in the UK, uh, because the United Kingdom imports... 40% of its food. Now, if we have a global famine, which is quite feasible, the way things that Andrew will know a lot about this as well, by the way, given his interests, if we have a global famine, then one of the first countries to start starving is going to be the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's going to cause some interesting political ructions. All what you're going to get is incredible sparks in food prices, yep. dramatic food prices, which will potentially mean countries can't afford to buy their own products. Uh, and that's why countries like India are saying no more food, ex no more rice exports from us. So, um, you know, 2023 is especially up problematic if they have hyperinflation because of capital flight. I mean, that's just a double. Yeah. Prediction. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we have, um, I don't think international coordination is going to work right now. It's going to be every country for itself where we start seeing food famines. And the ones that are going to survive that are the ones, of course, which are net food producers now. Mm. Daniel, uh, now it's time. Time for the pushback. So the pushback is orientated something like this, where um, the average, um, uh, you know, prosperity, living, uh, exp or the uh, life expectancy, I could give a whole list of reasons why um, the prosperity for humanity has actually increased. Now, I mean, we may uh, be... I think we are on the downside of that zenith, um, but the the I think that the single most determining factor wasn't so much the power structures and reorientating the power structures, but uh, physical um, obstacles that we're up against. And I, uh, Steve, I think you can um, echo this concern. It's it's less about the power structures and more about the the physical constraints on the environment and the um, um, the, the, the resource extraction and the efficiencies from which we transfer things into the most prosperous time civilization has ever seen. This is what we're, we're in right now, or we're coming out of, right? Yeah, yeah. And standard of living is at an unprecedented high. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so it doesn't seem like the, 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 the critical theory actually gives the devil its due. Or no, that's not even the right. That's not the right analogy. It doesn't give credit where it is due. Steve, I know. Uh, do you mind if I answer that? And then, yeah, so, sure. Um, you, uh, Dan, you, you actually captured a really good point, and this is actually what many of um, uh, ecological economics folks have been talking about. Um, I guess you can call it a degrowth school or whatever, um, where there are these physical constraints that's going to lead to more environmental catastrophes if we just keep taking our uh, our free good which is the natural soil uh and, and keep extracting keep extracting despite the amount of wealth that we have it's going to just lead to more uh, dire consequences especially for the climate um and i think this is a lot of say it's growth it's growth it's growth that's the problem we already have enough and this is where i would push back against that discussion or that ideation and say, look, we need to constitute what does growth actually mean? Um, well, no matter what type of society, there's growth of something. And that we have to talk about is what are we producing? How is value created? How is it distributed? And what type of system governs it? So not just focus on what Marx called use values, 
or you know the mere extraction and and, and using it we have or or exchange value uh, we have to talk about what constitutes growth and is it benefiting society as a whole is it solving hunger is it solving um our wants and needs etc and not just come out and saying that no more growth it's destroying the environment growth is all about the producing of this excess commodities and it's having unequal uh, uh, unequal ecological exchange, which is called in the literature. And I get that and I understand it. And I'm, and I, and I think it's all correct where I would say what's politically deadly in my view, it's just saying no growth. Cause a lot of folks, especially working class folks who are dependent on a system, they hear that you mean like, I'm going to have not have a job. I'm not going to uh, have a secure source of employment. Uh, what does that mean? So for the basic person who has to rely on an income, I think that language, that discourse is very dangerous. Um, so we should take those insights about those physical barriers and transform it into a language and say, okay, we are talking about growth, but growth of a different kind that's sustainable, that recognizes those physical limits that you talked about. And it is part of, uh, of a new system, a revolutionary system, where human needs are primary and uh, expanding human potential is the ultimate focus. Um, I hope that, I mean, that's, that's my few cents. And I, I think uh, Professor Keeney is going to respond to that too. Well, my perspective is more about the sustainability of the society we have. And uh, it, it, and what we've had is enormous growth, without a doubt, an enormous increase in the effective consumption of energy per capita. Yep. That's really, when you look yep. at what actually has gone up over the last century and a half, it's the amount of energy we consume. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, when I do the empirical work, I find that you know, fundamentally GDP is energy. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've had is an enormous increase in our capacity to exploit energy, and we've done continually growing that at an exponential growth rate every you know every year um so what you get out of that is yes how much higher prosperity than we've ever experienced before but coming from a level of en energy usage which wouldn't be deadly yet if we aren't also pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere which of course we have been doing so we're destroying the actual stability of the globe on which we live and that is the classic definition of unsustainable growth so we're definitely better off, but we're better off in a sense which will mean that we simply cannot sustain the path we're on now. So at some point, the future generations, and it may even be our generation, is going to be mm. much worse off than they are right now. And that, that progress will be seen as, as exploiting a cheap resource uh, far beyond where we should have exploited it, not, not a sustainable uh, pattern for human existence in the future. And what we should really, I'm not focusing on human and human uh, quality of life, David. I'm, I'm focusing on quality of life, period. Yeah. And we're, we've do, massively damaged the quality of life on this planet. And the thing which distinguishes the planet from any other planet we know is life. I mean, it's already happening. And we talked about prior to this program, I mean, the, 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 the boulder size um, hail in the streets of Milan. I mean, what? Uh, and other hmm. environments. I know. I mean, it, it, you're absolutely right. It's the whole basic existence of our planet. Um, where I would just say, and, uh, and providing the right discourse, I mean, here's one example where a lot of ecological economists use. They like to quote the Jevons paradox. Mm -hmm. And um, first of all, it's a neoclassical conception from uh, Stanley Jevons. Besides that, uh, they don't recognize, they say, oh, it's a substitution if we just merely substitute for one source uh the problems worldwide and growth will continue and it'll just be more more and more extraction and more and more depletion of our resources well actually from a critical and i would say better lens the jevons paradox is an income effect and what does that mean that's actually a nature of growth and that goes back to what i talked about before where it's a discussion of what growth constitutes so it's not just merely substituting something else it's in capture your point it's uh systemic transformations to help resolve those inherent contradictions. 
So we've got another question here from Murphy. Maybe Steve might be better suited to answer it. I don't know. I I wonder, does the shift in GDP to higher and higher percentage of non-productive fire sector change the energy to GDP calculus at all? Steve, what do you think? And I'll unmute you here. Sorry. Mm, Yeah. Uh, Interesting question. Um, in fact, when you look at the rate of economic growth over the last 40 years, which is really when financialization has occurred, it slowed down. So financialization has reduced the rate of economic growth. Now, if you were saying economic growth is a problem, that might sound like a good idea. But what's what we've done is, is, is consequently is generate far too many financial engineers. No, we're never in enough real engineers. And what we need to handle what's coming our way is real engineers who know how to make stuff who are aware of physical constraints and physical issues. And we have far less of them than we had per capita 40 years ago. And I think that's going to be uh, a, a double way in which the growth of the non-productive fire sector uh, makes things worse. And when I look at the global level and the global data, and it's quite ridiculous to look at this and just, just it, it makes a travesty of the idea of decoupling. Uh, because even though um, uh, with rate of economic growth has declined, and the growth of the financial sector has occurred while that decline has been going on, the rate decline in the rate of growth. Um, that hasn't changed at all the relationship between energy and GDP. Okay? It's just as strong as it was 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. GDP fundamentally is energy. So we've actually used the energy to do something useless, producing lots of you know high tails in, in Canary Wharf in the UK and housing bubbles, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that all ultimately is involved generating using energy to generate uh, products but you know, a lot of which we now regard as either crap or overproduced houses in america high rises in china etc cetera, etc cetera. none of those are going to be useful or necessary uh if we start going into climate breakdown so uh, it, it's changed the it's changed the calculus but it hasn't changed the the gdp to energy relationship at all strangely enough David, can you add anything to that? Sure. No, I, I agree. And um, in fact, uh, that's what Paul Barron and Paul Sweezy even and, uh, they, they dedicated a small chapter on it, but they did talk about it uh, on their chapter of waste in, um, in their book on Monopoly Capital is that when you have over accumulation at some point, you're going to have waste. And that waste is exactly what you're talking about. Uh, surplus production that does not serve humanity. I mean, houses, but nobody's living them. They're just resources for wealth extraction or wealth storage. Yeah. Um, um, the production of cheap shit where, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'll use it. Cheap shit. Uh, why are they cheap shit? Because you have piss poor wages and for stuff that only fancies somebody's uh, leisurely consumption, though when sold, they're not necessarily cheap, but you get the point what I'm trying to make. Um, so yeah, um, I agree. And that goes back to what I talked about before. It's about radically shifting what we think constitutes GDP and how it serves humanity, not the excess crap that we're finding. So we got another question here. We'll just keep this rolling along. Botch Mandela at Professor Steve Keen. Do you think the pockets of relative decoupling we're seeing in parts and times of the global north can be explained by financial bubbles? No, I think it's more explained by globalization. Uh, like if, if there's this, you know, using my Ravel software, I've, I've taken the uh, the OECD's database and energy primary energy use and the uh, World Bank's data on on GDP. And if you take a look at, you can find countries like the UK where GDP has gone up and energy use has gone down. Uh, and but you look at China and India, got other sort of story. The energy is growing faster than GDP is. Put it together globally, and they fit like a glove. I mean, I, could, I might risk my internet connection and try to show that particular graphic, um, but it's just overwhelming that that when you say decoupling, what you, when you look at the countries that are decoupling, they're the ones that have outsourced the manufacturing to the third world. The countries mm-hmm. that have energy usage growing faster than GDP, they're the ones where the production is taking place. Um, when, when, when you do the export, you know, the exports and imports are in there. It, if, you, if you do look at that, the imports of it, energy-based goods, into the UK, then the issue, the, de- the decoupling disappears. Um, maybe try to get that graphic ready, and I'll throw the same question to David and see what he's got to say. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I would agree. I mean, it, it's a 
you have uh, globalization of finance. You have institution, international institutions that spearhead that globalization of finance. So when there is a financial bubble in the United States, United States, it's a cough, but then the periphery suffers the plague. Um, we saw it, a prime example was uh, the decoupling uh, with respect to finance in the euro crisis, right? Um, there was a financial crisis because of um, the Great Recession coming into uh, emotion. Um, Germany coughed and um, the pigs, I know that's kind of not appropriate to use, but people know what I'm talking about, you know, Portugal, Ireland, mm -hmm. Spain, um, they caught the plague. And um, what happened, in my view, weren't the right structural adjustments, to use that term. It was more of the same type of stuff, which would probably cause another uh, such a cycle of, of uh, decoupling in the near future. I'm, I'm sure it's about to happen again, but the solutions that were supposed to happen did not happen. And why? Well, because the system won't allow it, because the system uh, favors one force over another. So... I'm in agreement. Dan, what do you think? Well, I don't know. I'm going to get kind of bleak in, uh, on everybody here, but... Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> I thought this conversation was already bleak. <laughs> well, that's the reality of it, but I mean... Uh, I, actually well, I really have my, my whiskey's right over here. Should I go... Should yeah, I go? <laughs> bring it out, bring it out, bring it out. The more peaty, the better, right? Um, <laughs> so... I mean, I really, really like that. I mean, I'll say it's a heuristic, a heuristic for me, mm -hmm. empirical foundation yep. for Steve. Um, but the the, um, the the GDP comparison and the, the high degree of correlation between GDP and, and energy uh, is, is is really great. It's a, that's a, that's that's really good. But what we're we're seeing if the energy uh, falls off of a cliff we're seeing we're going to see gdp fall off of a cliff and we're going to like okay i want to i want to sketch something for you here um in this dichotomy of an upward trending prosperity capitalist environment that we've we've seen over the last i guess uh after world war ii um you you can make the ca you can make the claim that 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 capitalism is the right way to go because look at all the benefits it's provided and you can just simply hold up um, communist countries versus, um, uh, you, you know, the, the, the lifestyles of, a, of American or North American, you know, or I guess uh, like even European countries. Now, I'm, you don't need to bite on that. That's not what I want to compare. This is a kind of a silly argument between communism and capitalism. That's not really where I want to go with this, but the 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 communist reality of of uh, of a reality like Mao China or um, or, or 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 Russia, um, it's it's horrific. I mean, there's there's stories of um, people eating each other because there's no food, starvation. It's just horrific, horrific stories. And um, why am I bleak? because it it doesn't feel like it's a choice if if energy falls off of a cliff and we lose by orders of magnitude due to collapse upon collapse with tipping points everywhere starting to just um unfold and i i think to myself like oh well it's not an ideological choice it's a it's now a um forced reality choice that we're we're we look at the the rea the ideological first trial of Maoist China and go all right now we're actually going there so now what does that mean and and I don't know if you guys share that sentiment but it's not like we have a choice and and I think I I keep hammering this um, I I think every episode because it's like it's dire. And, you know, what does that mean when we're looking at two orders of magnitude less of, of, um, of energy usage and still trying to feed and maintain, maintain any semblance of um, prosperity or, or survival for 8 billion people? 
Um, Steve, did you get that graphic? And Dan, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off there. That's uh, very insightful, and the audience yep. think, thinks you're being very bleak. Uh, do you have that ready, Steve? <laughs> yeah, can you see it now? I've, I've tried sharing at the oh, moment. Can I'll, you see it? I'll bring it up. Here we go. Okay, okay. So that is, that's um, World Bank data on GDP, as you can see up the top here, and OECD data on primary energy usage. And when you graph one against the other, you basically get a straight line, overlapping another straight line. If they were not so, that, that is a correlation coefficient of 0.997. Now, of course, they're both growing at the same time, which gives you a, 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 a higher, a, a faux correlation out of fact they're growing. This is the change in GDP on an annual basis versus the change in energy. And that correlation is 0.86. Now that is just incredible. I, I didn't had I didn't not expect to find anything that high. It seems to happen all the bloody time when I take on an avenue which is anti neoclassical. I come up with stuff that, as I told my students at the time, if I I wouldn't dare make up imaginary data that is as dire as the real data. Okay, so the stuff comes out even stronger than I expect to see it to be. So you can see how close that correlation is. It's ridiculous. Now, if you go and take a look at uh, United States which I'll just move the pointer there, that's the USA. So what you're seeing there is, well, there's GDP growing and energy is constant or falling. You still get very strong correlation with the change, but that's what people are saying, oh, there's decoupling going on. Now, they look at India, you see exponential growth in energy and GDP and energy growing faster than GDP for most of that time. The same, Great Britain, as the classic people say about decoupling, yeah, okay, well, it's because it's deindustrialized. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's why it's consumption is coming and not the primary energy usage. Uh, well, the country like China, you get a uh, you know, dramatic increase in energy and GDP. Again, the changes are fairly relatively close to a couple of all the same. Those, by the way, are the same percentage levels. Normally, when I do a graphic, a GDP, one variable on one side and another on the other, I've got, I've got to use operate axes because the change will be such different scales. But here throughout, change in GDP is the same scale as change in energy. Uh, and then they look at a country like Australia, which is a an exporter. Okay, we see you know declining usage of energy, increasing GDP, but still the same change correlation. So the overall analysis stands there. GDP is energy, and so I think Ghost asked, uh, "What is uh, Ravel in a nutshell?" It's a it's a graphical user interface for multidimensional data analysis, and our, our intention is to it's built on top of Minsky. Uh, it's a commercial program. I hope to start selling it by the end of the year or beginning of next year commercially uh, to fund what I do in terms of research and uh, and try to pull together all the rebels into one place and take on the neoclassicals properly. But we'll never get funding to do it without uh, get reading of the neoclassicals. But that's yeah, that's rebel. That's the data. And it just you know anybody who says the decoupling going on, you're either looking at national data or you're not looking at data. You're not taking account of the real world. That's great stuff. Really great wow. stuff. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I have the luxury of playing around with Ravel and it's just for anybody that's wondering exactly what it is here, just, it can simply collect data in the form. I, I think at this point, just CF, uh, v or C, CSV CSV. files. Yeah. At this point, I'm sure you guys will try to expand that in the future, but I've, I've used it for even the, the analytics for the show. <laughs> I've used the program for so and it's uh, I know a lot of you have seen Minsky it basically sits over top of Minsky so you, if you're uh, familiar with Minsky it's very intuitive to you so it's it's a cool thing I hope I hope it kind of moves along there go on so rough uh, rough uh, back of napkin calculation expanding beyond where where that graph was showing I think like the beginning was like 1960 um if, if I kind of go uh, to like maybe the 20s or so, you're probably looking at 14 million tons, something like that, um, instead of 140 million tons. That for everybody, just to add to the bleakness is, is one order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude is 1.4 million tons of, of oil usage. So oh, uh -huh. you, you can understand how empirically the, the, how bleak it actually is. Mm. And, I, and so if we, this, sorry, go ahead. I interrupted. That's okay. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, if we face a plunge in energy, we face a plunge in GDP. 
Yeah. And the more luck that's going to happen is we'll have events which damage our GDP in various ways, like you know, the Milan, uh, what the hell are you going to call that? The Milan, the Milan um, uh, ice flood. Um, yeah. That will um, lead to us probably using more energy, trying to hang on to our lifestyle. So we'd like to see a break between energy and GDP, uh, but it won't, uh, it won't work. Ghost, you better get in touch with me and see what's going to happen down there and trying to build it on the, on the Mac. Uh, we'd like to have a bit of work doing that. So uh, uh, I think you know my email. If you don't, let me know and I'll pass it on to you and we can carry on in that conversation. David, what were you going to say? And uh, I'm, I agree. And I think this is a fantastic ma empirical manifestation that should be widely distributed, like you said. Um, and, but it goes back to my point of we need to really seriously sit down and discuss what constitutes growth. Uh, because when somebody looks at this, they can say, oh, um, and this is based on the interactions I have and what I've seen to come across, they'll start generating these very Malthusian, neo-Malthusian arguments that says, well, population is a problem we need, you know, for the, if half the population, you know, uh, if there are no more births and dies off, you know, we'll, we'll decrease energy use. And to me, that's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that's very reactionary. Um, it go the appropriate discussions that need to be had uh, while critiquing, you know, modernization theory that if we just keep growing and that we follow this way, uh, things will get better, which it won't. We need a more critical perspective and say if we're going to meet these physical limits and this excessive energy use that rises with the growth that we have and uh, how it's currently constituted and these environmental consequences are going to happen and they're going to be dire they already are dire and they're already happening we need to have a critical engaging consensus discussion of how we make growth that's sustainable and gdp that is a measure of human happiness i mean you have the genuine progress indicator which is fantastic you have other these new variables that come out to actually discuss what growth should be and how it should be expanded, which pertains to human needs and human potential. So I may sound like a broken record, but I think that's incredibly important, in, in, uh, especially in this discussion. So we got another question, Botch Mandela. We're still on the same topic. Do you know what percentage of global GDP is a bubble? I thought it would be a fair chunk. How is that contributing to CO2 emissions? It can't be surely. We must be recoupling i think he's saying that looking at what like um uh was it great britain having its decline but it's just exporting its emissions to other countries um can you add something to that question steve or david i'll i'll, I'll quickly throw in there i think about 20 percent of global gdp at least would be bubble based i mean if you look at the housing bubbles commercial yep. property bubbles etc etc the finance sector itself is part of a bubble and that's about you know in some countries getting up to 20, 10 15 percent of gdp uh, and they're producing you know it's adding cost to the rest of the economy it's not adding output to the rest of the economy so i see the finance sector as a cost and and therefore the larger it gets the more you've got a bubble going on there rather than real real contributions if we looked at uh it took out what's being financed by fire uh dynamics uh, by financial sector uh, behavior, then I think that it's of the order of 20% of GDP. And if it's 20% of GDP that misses, it, we wouldn't miss it in the least. So, um, you know, to me, it's a very destructive component. And of course, what it's going to mean is when we need you know, to change direction radically, we won't have the skill set necessary to do it because far too many rocket scientists are now working on Wall Street. <laughs> it's a very good point. <laughs> um... Yeah, uh, uh, Professor Key nail, uh, nailed it. Um, you know, we have a financialized world economy, and a significant chunk of growth is is uh, is fire, which still has these um, emissions that are ecological contradictions. But some folks will say, "Okay, fine, we just have to get rid of financialization and go back to a time period of what oftentimes folks call the golden age of, of capitalism, where it was Keynesian-induced aggregate demand management based on long-run sales and growth in industrial production, not the short-termism, which is the um, normal. I would say normalizing, but is the is the um, the the the, the what structures our, our current world economy. And I even think that uh, that's not necessarily 
I mean, sure, uh, let's go back to the welfare benefits that were uh, quite prevalent during that age. Uh, but for ecological res reasons, that's probably not, that's not ideal because there were incredible amounts of waste and incredible amounts of ecological contradictions in that. And, and we see it with uh, the industrialization. How do we know it's going to be heavily regulated and heavily structured to prevent emissions? Uh, well, we don't, as we see in, in, in the periphery. So um, can we uh, just end financialization and go back to that productive regime, which will solve these um, energy problems and, and, uh, and, and, and um, ecological contradictions? I'm not so optimistic, which again goes back to what I said before. Well, yeah. transformations have to happen. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. We're, we're, we're not at all equipped for the change in direction we need to want to take. Yep. And a large part of the financialization is a major reason why. And that financialization was the real impact of neoliberal, neo neoclassical arguments in favor of deregulation. It wasn't right. the manufacturing sector that boomed. The manufacturing sector, in fact, crashed or moved to, com to, to communist China. Yeah. Right. Um, it, we, we actually destroyed manufacturing by, de by deregulating. Exactly. And, uh, and, and like in that, that's the capital controls Dave was talking about earlier. Capital controls, in my opinion, include where the machines are as well as where the money flows. And so with American companies were allowed to export the manufacturing capability to China. And that's why we have the Rust Belt in America. And that's yep. a large part of what gave us Trump. So all this stuff, you know, we've had a whole period. We're going to look back and say, how on earth did you let these fuckwits take over running your society? Yeah, the answers are there. Um, you know, I mean, it's like uh, that great book, uh, What's the Matter with Kansas, right? Uh, it's a fantastic book. This, how can these folks just be supporting such fascists and reactionary ideologues, et cetera, where you look back in the day, places like Kansas was the hotbed for union radicalism, even in Montana and, and uh, even Utah with, um, what's his name, who was uh, assassinated? Uh, his name I can't forget. I, I'm forgetting. Um, at any rate, Professor Keene is right. Um, the answers are there. Everybody, thanks for tuning in to the show. The chat has been off the chart today. A lot of great questions. And, of course, that, that sub-conversation that happens on every show is always great to kind of watch. It's distracting at times. Steve was distracted earlier. Um, no, he wasn't distracted. He just ignored me for 30 seconds. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Let's get it right. Yeah. No. <laughs> Make sure you're hitting that like button if you haven't. <laughs> Hit the like button in the last two hours. Hit it now. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed to the Prof. Steve Keen channel. After the show, if you have time, put a comment in there. If you've got nothing to just uh, say, just put great show. Really, it's my experiment to see if that helps the algorithm, you know, boost the impressions of our show. One thing I did do this week is I've taken out in the title, it says Steve and Friends with such and such guests live stream such and such i've decided well the thumbnail says steve and friends i should be putting a topic matter in the title so this week i've tried that so i think what what do i have this week um for for an exchange yeah i think i'm going to try to do that each week just so when people type let's say they're looking for information on foreign exchange they type it instead of seeing steve and friends which to them means nothing they'll go to another video that says foreign exchange our video will come up and we can kind of get some okay. more viewers. So I've changed that. Um, mm. If you're over on Twitter, like you know what to do because I tell you about six or seven times a show, hit the fucking like button, retweet, <laughs> and then come over here. <laughs> Well, you got to show the My wife has just turned up with a beautiful Thai food for me in the middle of the call. Come, come, come here. Come here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come say hi. Come on. 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 The, and it's the great thing is, is Steve's got a stellar internet connection right now, so we can actually see his food. It's a uh, yeah, get it stuck it's, in my teeth. And it's a good point. Not I'll, I'll chew slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, Daniel, before we we've got ten minutes left. Um, do you have any final questions for David? I was curious if David. Um, I want to tap into David's knowledge and interest 
uh, geopolitically. And I'm curious what you think of um, Peter Zihan and his um, uh, population centric analysis. His uh, who, who who are you speaking of? Peter Zihan. I'll be um, I'll be honest. Oh, you don't know him, eh? I don't. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> who, who who is Peter Zion? Yeah, I I I don't know. He's um, I guess it's um, anybody that uh, really focuses on um, like population dynamics. So you know, like um, increasing in population means uh, determined um, like economic prosperity so declines in china on their uh you know that band of population that is productive workforce is uh, a predictor of, of of their upcoming failure like he's very very um bearish on china very optimistic on the us um on south america um yeah very very interesting fellow um and i guess it's maybe in the in the tradition of, um, I think it was Adam Foote's uh, mainstream mm -hmm. book, uh, Boom, Bust, and Echo, you know, this kind of like population-centric analysis. I was wondering what you were um, When that. it comes to population-centric analyses, um, I'll be really honest, I, I, I had a, a bit of an aversion because uh, it just reminds me of Malthus, who I, my, I uh, just awful. Uh, because the primary, um, Malthus is interesting, right? I mean, he talked a lot about effective demand, which was interesting, even though it was a leisure class that has the, the, uh, the effective demand capacity, which is interesting. But besides that, um, Malthus, uh, his, his general argument was if we increase the population because of physical limits, it'll, it'll just be the chaos because they'll be fighting over a limited stock. Um, but he was a priest. So he didn't advocate birth control. He said those um, who suffer from moral turpitude, which are the lower classes, should, you know, inevitably will die off and things will get better. And women, um, if they just keep producing specifically poor women, um, you know, if they just keep producing uh, babies and babies and babies without birth control, what a wonderful guy. Right. Um, they'll help um, the working class die off and, and things will get better. So this is why I have a real aversion with population studies, because I'm afraid it will lead to arguments that, well, if it's those parasites. And oftentimes when we talk about the parasites in the mainstream level, it's not the, you know, up at top. It's, well, you know, those who are consuming too much, uh, the working people need to stop consuming, et cetera. Uh, you know, stop, you know, buy nothing, you know, look at fit, whatever. Um, uh, it just goes back to my discussion that if we're going to talk about population, we need to have a more critical structural discussion. Are we in the system where population is rising and human needs are being met? So we don't dangerously take that route where we start having the Malthus lens and we start talking about, well, folks, should, folks just start to die off. Um, you know, too much people, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I'm, it, I know it's a lot more complex than that, but it just, on my own, my own personal view, I think it's dangerous and it can lead to very classist um, um, or even fascistic ways of, of uh, thinking about resolutions. Mm, yeah. That mm. Malthusian trap we've had, we've had Steve at one point say, well, so what call me a Malthusian, but I think the context was a little <laughs> different. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Malthus made one, I mean, he got the, he's actually quite right when he spoke about the, if you compare a linear trend in food to an exponential trend in population, you can see that they're going to have a breaking point. And um, he then, because you said he was <laughs> a very, the, the class background of, of Ricardo, Malthus and Say, a remarkable combination of, of, of clashing ideologies and clashing analytic approaches. And by Malthus, by focusing, if we'd focused on exponential growth at early stage, which is what we could have got out of Malthus alone, we'd be a damn sight better off. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm generally speaking, I'd, I'll come down and say that, like Malthus also talked about effective demand. And what did Ricardo do? He borrowed the crap from Say, which yeah. is the first proto neoclassical. 
So you've got yep. this crazy combination of a, of a classical class-based analysis tied onto a utility maximizing framework for the macroeconomics. That's part of the disaster we live in now is the yep. product of that. So if it had Malthus coming in, Malthus with Ricardo is far better than Say with Ricardo. But neoclassical mm -hmm. economics came out of Say with Ricardo. So uh, and I'll still hang up for Malthus on that particular front. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, the effective demand argues, arguments from Malthus are, are fantastic, uh, mm. albeit um, he, he, he focused on the wrong area of where that effective demand should come from. Um, and his other arguments of, you know, the dangerous classes suffering from moral turpitude. Um, mm. um, but yeah, I, I'd agree. I just, I just don't want to get. I just don't want to have that Malthusian trap where we make Malthusian arguments, which can be translated into very classist and dangerous and even fascist conclusions. At the same time, we have modern modern Malthus. It's going to see the most important thing we can do for the sustainability of our population in the future is to ensure diversity. Yeah, because if we don't, if we if we have a population collapse and we're left just with Scandinavians. For example, my uh, we, my 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 partner will to reproduce in, in far shorter period than will fail if we have Scandinavians and Africans, and yeah. Chinese and and Latin Americans and a few others. So, yeah. the modern Malthusian argument is in favour of much diversity as possible, not letting the whites win, which yeah. was the Malthus that's case. That's brilliant, Steve. That is really brilliant, and that's my the, partner. She's that's the strongest case for that for the for the. Um, that's really what that overused buzzword of um, inclusivity um, yeah. should should be, you know, should be yeah. uh, evolutionary in nature to say, yeah. you know what, you have ant species, which by, I got this from E.O. Wilson, but biomass weight, like biomass wise, mm -hmm. ants mm -hmm. have the same total biomass as humans on the planet, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, the issue is, is that if there's, um, ecological biodiversity collapse and population collapse. We have one species. <laughs> they have hundreds of species, like we're, thousands. We're, we're, I don't know what yeah, their yeah. numbers are, but like the, the, the chances of survival, just awesome. like, yeah, pure numbers are just you know. There's, there's potentially a trillion species on this planet, probably probably measured in billions rather than trillions, but we're focused on one species ourselves. And we've yeah. made that the reference point for everything. And that is what's destroying us um, yeah. or will destroy us. So we have to see the only thing I think we have a chance of surviving is to see ourselves as custodians of life. That's what mm -hmm. our responsibility should be. And, and and if we focus just upon humans, we're immediately made the huge mistake. I miss well, I mean, that that's, the, that's the essence of, of classical political economy, in my view, and it's specifically Marx. Um, mm -hmm. It's life within the system that we, uh, where we extract them from nature the means uh, to survive and uh, give us our wants, et cetera. So that sustainability requires um, human cooperation and human cooperation with the uh, natural gifts from the land that are that are given to us. Um, we just need the appropriate lens. I mean, I have mine and I, I think it's shared with you guys um, mm. of how that uh, peaceful sustainability can happen. Well, we are at we are at the top of the second hour. Um, David, you are now on the list of reoccurring guests. So, um, um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, now, don't now. Here's uh, Douglas, the MMT macro traders on this list too. It's actually a pretty demanding list. Uh, like I'm always looking for new guests, right, to expand the whole thought, right? But often I can't find somebody, so I've got to go out and go into that reserve list. You are now on that list, right? So I may have those awkward. So, am I the uh, am I the reserve army of labor? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. <laughs> maybe, always, maybe, but most, maybe most of the time maybe, I'll be unemployed. <laughs> maybe this guy's the reserve army of leisure. Yes, I like that. That's better. Okay, that's better. Everybody, thanks for joining in, chatting. Make sure at, before we go, you hit that like button. And at the end of the show, when the comment section opens up, just uh, you know, put a comment there. I don't care what you put. Um, I just want to see how that helps with the uh, algorithm. The more we get, I'm, I'm assuming we'll get more impressions. So do that. If you're still on Twitter, um, don't bother coming over here now because we're, we're ending the show. It's pointless. But hit hit the fucking like button. 
retweet, um, get the show out there. David Fields, thank you very much for joining us. We better put the claps. Thank you for having me. Hmm. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. And just to be here conversing with y'all is is a uh, jewel in my crown. Um, and just to be, uh, yeah, just to be recognized is, is uh, an incredible honor. So thank you. you. You are You are the man in my eyes. Anyways, guys, for Daniel, Steve, and David, see you later, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Okay.